Hi there folks. In this video we're going to have a look at setting up and loading shotgun shells using the Lee Lodol and the Lee Lodol 2. Now the Lee Lodol is an inexpensive shot shell reloading press sold by Lee Precision and it's available in 12, 16 and 20 gauges. There's a few things that you have to uh, be careful about when you're using any loading tool in regards to safety and of course the first thing that you have to be careful with is making sure that you use an appropriate charge of powder and shot and wad and so forth. And so to get yourself off to a good start I recommend purchasing a handbook. Uh, this is the Lyman 5th edition shot shell reloading handbook and that's a good reference to have if you're going to load shotgun shells you should uh, avail yourself of some good information so I recommend that as a purchase. That will give you lots of loading data and if you read through the uh, instructional portion of this uh, book you'll have a good grasp of how to select a load and so forth so that's once again that's highly recommended. Now the Lee Lodol is uh, a fairly lightweight machine and it needs to be securely attached to a bench or a board or something of that nature in order to use it because there's actually quite a bit of uh, leverage on this machine when you're cycling it so there are actually three attachment points here on the base. There is a, a hole at the front for a screw and then there's a hole on each side at the back for a screw. And if you can, it's probably best to attach this to a workbench of some sort, something fairly sturdy. One thing about this machine, if you uh, were to look at the, the way the handle depresses, you can see that if you mount it, I'll go down a little further with the camera, if you mount it uh, too far back from the edge of uh, a bench, the handle will actually run into the table or whatever bench you've got it mounted on. So it's actually necessary to mount the whole machine quite far to the front of the, uh, the bench that you're going to use it on. And that's so that the handle will actually go down lower than the, uh, the bench surface. It actually goes down about probably two inches lower than the front of the bench. So this is going to limit you know where you can mount this. You can't put this way back on the bench. You have to put it fairly far towards the front. If you've got the machine in your hands it's pretty obvious uh, how far back you can go because you can just depress the entire handle mechanism down and that'll give you a good idea of where you have to be. And obviously you want to give yourself some hand clearance as well. So once you've got the machine uh, securely fastened down to whatever it is you're going to attach it to, the next thing you're going to do is you're going to remove this plate on the front of the machine and it uses a uh, either a quarter inch nut driver or you can actually use just a regular slotted uh, screwdriver. A nut driver works a little better, it gets a better purchase on it. These screws are just a uh, self-tapping type screw, they're very short and they just go into the plastic of the machine. And these uh, hold on this plate and the plate in turn holds the charge bar in place. So the charge bar is just this plastic bar, it's got two holes in it. This one on this side, the large one, is the uh, the hole for the shot bushings on the right hand side. On the left hand side is the, the hole for the powder bushings. Now you can notice there's a little tab here on the front of each one and we'll see how that works. We'll get our, our tray of bushings out here which are supplied with the machine and you can see these, once again, these larger bushings are the ones for the, the shot and they're marked on the front of them. You can see that one there is marked one and one eighth. So we'll uh, have a look through here to find the one that's the one ounce bushing since that's what uh, I'm going to load. And there we go. There we've got the uh, the one ounce bushing. It's marked with a number one. So we can just simply put the bushing up into the, uh, the charge bar like that. They'll pretty much stay there. They're friction fit. And then we want to find uh, a correct powder bushing. And I'm just going to Put a random one in here at the moment because I'm not actually going to use this machine to load the shells. I've actually got another one set up so we're just going to pick a, a bushing out of this uh, kind of at random. Don't take it as loading advice. So we'll pick out uh, number 116 and you can see the bushing has a marking on the front of it. There's 116, maybe you're going to use 122 and whatever bushing it is you're going to select you put it into the other, the other side it slides up in like that. And one nice feature about these, these bushings having this uh, 
tab on them is that if you for some reason don't have a bushing in the machine and you tried to load shells with the bar in the powder or the shot would actually just leak right out that hole so it would not be possible to use the machine without a bushing uh, some other brands of machine you can actually load shells uh, without the bushing installed especially the powder bushing and that will lead to a huge overcharge of powder in the majority of cases I've actually seen uh, the results of that and it's not pretty there I was a guy at the club that did that one time and uh, it kind of got exciting so with our uh, with our bushings in place of course it's just a simple matter to slide the bar back into the machine and we can take our plate put the plate back over and we want to line up the hole with the screws put the screws back in place and you can snug those down you don't have to get too aggressive with getting that tight because it is once again just uh, just threaded into plastic so you could strip those if you got too aggressive with that and uh, of course, we will be ready to add shot and powder to the machine. Now, with a little more reference to selecting bushings, once again, you've got your your good reference material here, your shot shell loading book. You can also go to uh, some of the powder companies' websites. They also have information on, on loads. But if you get a book such as this, uh, there's, a, there's a charge bushing table in the back, and it will give the various charges that you can expect to be dropped with this machine with the different bushings so it gives you accurate arms powders, Alliant, Hogden, IMR, Winchester and it goes through the various powders that these companies offer with the various bushings and it will give you a, an approximate charge that these should drop. This is not, and the, the companies are very clear to say this, this is not a recommended load table all of these combinations are not necessarily valid as loads. This is just strictly a, a table to tell you what you could expect to be dropped by these bushings. Um, that can vary a bit, and it can vary from the number that's on this chart. This is just a, a rough guide. It can vary because the operator technique will have uh, of using the machine will have an effect on how much vibration. Uh, is transferred to the powder and how it packs down in the machine between the different cycles and also powder there's going to be some variation from lot to lot in the density so it's it's advisable for you uh, for your own safety to weigh each charge it's been in my experience that most of these charge tables will give you um, a charge which is actually a little bit lighter than what's in the book um, and, you know the real the real world charge will drop a little lighter than what's in the book I think that's probably done on purpose to be a little bit uh, to err on the side of safety but I do recommend uh, weighing your charges out under actual machine operating conditions so don't just drop charges without uh, operating the machine because that will th that will throw artificially light charges you may be tempted to put a bigger bushing in to get a larger charge you have to actually run the machine through the cycles of loading and that will compact the powder with vibration from using the machine and that will give you a more accurate um, idea of what you're actually getting in your shells so don't just don't just randomly you know drop charges and expect that to be the exact charge you're getting when you're using the machine so we're going to move over to a second machine which I've got bolted down and we're going to load some shells using that machine. Filling the Lee load all up with powder is uh, pretty straightforward. Powder hoppers have a nice large opening on the top, so I find it's not even uh, necessary to use a funnel to fill these because of the uh, rather generous opening. Even with a big can, like this uh, can of Promo, with a big, with a big, big spout on it, it's still possible to just pour it straight into the hopper and, uh, and not have to really worry about spilling if you're halfway as careful at all. And the hopper loads, uh, the hopper holds a decent amount of powder, not an enormous amount, but it's it's not too bad. We'll go over and we'll top up the uh, the shot as well. Once again, you've got a nice big opening here, makes it uh, fairly easy to fill. Of course, you always have to be careful with shot because it spills. It's one of those things that once you spill it, it's a, it's an annoying thing that's everywhere. And the hopper holds about eight pounds a shot. Sorry, five pounds a shot. And I'm not going to overfill that, I'll just put that much in and move on from there. 
we can put the cover back on. You'll notice I've got some uh, duct tape on the, the cover here to hold the bushing the bushings inside to keep that from spilling. And we're all topped up and ready to go. Okay, let's have a look at the primer feed mechanism. This is the only optional accessory that Lee makes and sells for this machine. And it's a very simple, cheaply made little plastic dew flicky. It's got a separate reservoir and cover. And it's got this priming chute here. And a little post which comes up and it's got a spring on it. And to put this together, you slide the reservoir onto the chute. We'll leave the cover off for now. We're going to get our carton of primers. And I'm going to open it up so that 50 primers are exposed. I'm going to take the reservoir and or tray and flip it upside down. I'm going to slide the tray over the top of the primer carton and turn them over as a unit. And angling this down a little bit, I'm going to pull the, uh, the carton of primers away and that will release the primers onto the tray. Take our cover and we'll clip it over the back here, slide it ahead. And be careful with this thing because it is all just press fit together. It can fall apart on you if you're not careful. And then you want to give the, uh, the whole thing a bit of a shake and see if you can get the primers to fall down into the trough there. So there we have a fully loaded uh, priming mechanism. And this will sit in the machine and basically the shell is pushed down over the leading primer that's sitting on top of that post. So when that happens, the, uh, the shell is, is forced down over that primer and put in place. And this system here, it will sit down in this position. You can see that there's another primer has not been fed on top of that post. So when you go to load the next shell, you have to actually pick this whole thing up manually and hope that the primer slide ahead. There's one slide slid ahead. And then you're ready to load the next shell on top of it. And you can see here sometimes the primers kind of bridge. And I think these work better with certain brands of primers than others. And you'll find as you use it you may have to uh, you know bang on it and tap on it to get the primers to feed through that trough. Anyway, it does work and it's a fairly inexpensive thing. Okay, I brought the primer feed over to the machine here. You can see there's a little raceway here in the machine and a hole. And that just fits down in there like that. Pretty straightforward. Okay, let's uh, review the basic loading sequence on a Lee Lodal. And the machine works from the left side of the machine here. This is the sizing and depriming station. It works its way on over to the right, priming. Next stage over here is for powder, wad, shot. Next stage after that is crimp start, and the last station finalizes the crimp. So we're going to start off with the sizing and decapping. You will need the sizing ring. You can see this one has the number 12 marked on it, indicating that it's for the 12 gauge. Of course, they are available in 16 and 20 as well. Be sure you have the correct one for your machine. The correct orientation of this sizing ring is with the groove at the top. If you look on the inside of the sizing ring, you'll see that on the bottom of it, it has a, a groove ground into it. And right above that groove, there's the sizing ring. This is actually the portion of the, uh, the sizing ring which actually does the work on the shell. That little shiny spot there, that's what actually presses the brass or uh, steel case head back down to size. And on the other end, the top end on the inside, you can see there is no such ridge. So to give you an idea why it's important to put this on the shell with the ridge on the top, you can see that it came to an abrupt halt when it hit the brass. If you put the sizing ring on the shell upside down, it will drop right over and it won't do anything as far as sizing goes. You can actually omit the sizing with the sizing ring if you are using shells which were fired in your own gun. Um, it may not be necessary to actually do this, but for the extra little bit of work, I think it's probably advisable to use that and that way the shells you load can be used in any gun. So we'll set the shell underneath the decapping station here. You can see there's a big steel decapping pin and the base of the machine has a big hole here for the primers to fall through. 
And this little door in the front here covers up where the primers uh, are deposited. Every now and then you have to reach in there and clean out some of the, uh, the expended primers, or you can be more clever than that. You can actually put a receptacle underneath your bench to, uh, to catch those fired primers. So with the shell in the uh, first station, we'll lower the handle down, and the plastic here contacts the sizing ring and forces it down over the shell, and the decapping pin has pushed the primer out, and we'll pull the shell off, and you can see there that the, the cap or the uh, primer has been pushed free of the shell, and the sizing ring has been pushed down almost flush with the base of the shell. And one nice thing about the, the Lee Lodol is that it actually will size the rim of the, uh, the case. If it's actually, if the rim is too big, it will actually squash that back down a little bit. And that's something that a lot of machines don't do. And that can be important in shells which have been fired a lot because they will actually, uh, if the rim gets too big, they can actually hang up in the magazine of a pump shotgun or semi-auto and not feed correctly. And I've seen that happen a few times with shells loaded on uh, other machines. So moving over to the next station, we're going to reprime the shell. And you can see here that I've got the, the uh, primer feed apparatus set now up. You can put the shell right over the hole, or you can actually shove it up over the, the ram there. And that's what I prefer to do. The crimp will usually hold it in place sufficiently. And you want to lower the handle down. And that will strip the sizing ring off the shell. And it will also press that primer that was sitting in the primer feed up flush. Now, if you push the handle down far enough, the primer will be mounted flushly in the case. And that's important if you have a primer that's standing high, there is the possibility that it could be uh, detonated by the gun's mechanism upon closing if you're using especially a semi-auto or a pump action. So you want your primers to be seated flush. So moving on from that station, we'll go over to the station with the wad guide on it here. And with the shell tucked up under the wad guide, and there's a trick to this too, you have to kind of angle the shell, catch the front of it, and angle the shell back underneath the wad guide. If you try to shove it straight in, you can actually get it caught underneath the fingers of the wad guide, and then the wad will go through and pinch the fingers off the wad guide, so it's important to kind of rock that shell underneath with that motion. So once you've got the shell in there, pull the handle down to the bottom all the way, and the uh, charger bar should be over in the left hand position here. You can see the tab is over to the side mark powder. And with it in that position and the correct uh, bushing in there, you can flick the uh, charge bar across to the right and we'll lift the handle up again. And we're going to get a wad and we'll set a wad. You can either set the wad in the wad guide like that or what I tend to do is just press the wad up underneath the guide and lower the handle down until you get to the uh, correct amount of resistance. You can feel it seated there. Then we'll push the charge bar from right to left and that will drop the shot down into the shell. You can pull the shell out there, you can see the shot inside. Then we'll move the shell over to the next station which is starting the crimp. Now in these machines they come with uh, the 6 and 8 point crimps starters built in. On the 12 gauge machines the 8 point crimp starter is at the front and the six point is at the back. Now because the crimp starters are molded as part of the machine it's necessary for you to index the shell correctly so that the the fingers on the crimp starter will index with the folds on the shell. And What you want to do is you can see where there's a kind of a, an indentation between the pedals. You want to get one of those grooves at the front. So that groove there, any of the, these grooves need to be directly at the front of the machine. When you have it oriented like that, you can lower the handle down. And you might want to hold it for a second here just to get the crimp started. Some shells have more memory than others. You can see that the crimp has been started. And we'll immediately move the shell over to the final station. And that will finish the crimp. And you can vary to a certain degree the amount of crimp by how hard you push the shell down. You can see I didn't push that hard that time. And we have just, you know, a basically formed crimp. If I put the shell back in there, and push down harder. I can push the uh, the center of the crimp in a little better and get a nicer form crimp. It actually puts a little bit of a taper on the shell as well. So it actually does a, a pretty good job of these double A shells. Other types of shells you may have to experiment with the amount of crimp that you give because some of them will not take a lot of force. 
some types of shells will crush if you try to put too much force on them. So that's one of those things you're going to have to learn kind of by doing.